Hey everybody, this is Captain Gun. Oh, welcome back. We're finished looking at the two first Jack and Axe games, so let's just look at the Jack 3. I'll try to keep this review a bit short than the old one since the Jack 2 review dragged on quite a bit, but no one really cares, so let's just dive in. A while after Jack 2's ending, we see Jack being sentenced to death by desert by a guy who was totally there before, Count Vigor. Apparently, a few Melheads didn't die, and they attacked the city, and Jack, being associated with crew, and therefore being associated with letting the Melheads into the city, is banished to the wasteland for life. Ashlyn gives Jack some sort of beacon, and then they fly away. Daxter and Pecker stay behind, then they pass out in the desert. Some people would pick them up and drag them to Spargus, a refugee desert city. The leader of this place is Deimos, who we find out way later is an early ruler of Haven City, who was overthrown and banished by Baron Praxis. Spargus is all about people being useful to the city, and we need to do some arena matches to earn our citizenship. So let's recap. Jack does things, Daxter sits on his shoulder, and Pecker translates for a man who doesn't need a translator. How nice. Jack does the first of the arena matches and we get a scouting gun for going to participate. We go to Dark Jack in the middle of it, Demos is curious, then we get a proof of winning in the first arena match and the blaster. You know since the game is shoving the gun mods down our throats, let's discuss weapons. Every weapon for Jack 2 returns, so that's a nice thing, but this time around the enhancement mods like extra damage, for example, are entirely optional and not given throughout points in the story. They are bought with precursor orbs. This time around, precursor orbs are not only located in cubs, but they also work differently. Each each secret has a price on it, so you don't just need to get a certain amount of precursor orbs, which makes the precursor orbs more like the currency like it was in Jack 1. Also, the weapons themselves get extensions, which, depending on the mouth, can break the game. The red gets an area of effect weapon and a grenade launcher, the yellow gets a reflective blaster and a UFO, the blue one gets a blazer beam and a homing weapon, and the purple one gets an anti-gravity gun and a screen nuke. Quite a few, especially the reflective blaster, breaks the game in half. The extensions are acquired throughout the story, and you get the game breaking one not long after starting the game. Of course, the difficulty is toned down, mostly since there are many more checkpoints, which to me, in this scenario, Scenario is kind of a bad thing. In this game, there are very few threats. Threats you encounter mostly involve platforming. Not only due to the overpowered guns, but also due to the reduced challenge. This is the easiest Jack and Daxter game, which probably draws a few people in, but it kinda makes me un uninterested to be honest. It's still a fine game, it plays this a bit over the first game for me, but it's nowhere close to Jack 2. Even though its difficulty was a bit too much in areas, it did at the very least keep me involved and on my toes, which in the end made me care more about what I actually did. Anyway, we do some missions for Cleaver, a guy who speaks kinda like crew, and C, a monk who is either a man or a woman. The game never specifies, and even calls it a man at certain points and women at other points, so I'll call it Seam Machine Mail. We get a warning from Seam that the end is coming. Isn't that just great? And the story just holds a bit. Nothing really happens until we get an hour or two further. There's a small scene which features some guy and a communicator, but it's only there to show us that things are happening. Later on, we get to the precursor Monk Temple, and we ditch it for a trip to the volcano. There we see that some people can get petrified by Dark Eco, which only makes the rabbit hole go much deeper. But Jack, since he's been in some Dark Eco experiments, some how gets the ability to go invisible by touching statues. It's pretty situational, which is a shame. There's also a layered Dark Eco upgrade which makes you throw a purple thing, but even that's not really useful. True, there are a few areas where you do platform-esque things with them, which is a step up from Jack 2, but it still has potential of being great. However, when we return to the Monk Temple, we go inside to see Wigger and see him talking about the whole end of the world thing, and when they leave, we go after this bigger statue. It says that they can balance out the Dark Eco before it takes over Jack, which brings something that completely overshadows Dark Jack. Meet Light Jack, and just like the name implies, it uses Light Eco instead of Dark Eco. Instead of being a not that useful offensive transformation, it's a useful defensive transformation. By the end of the game, you'll have 4 abilities with Light Jack. The first you get is the one you'll use the most, Light Regeneration. Then you have Light Freeze, where you slow down time. After that you get Light Shield, the one that I didn't use. Then you have Light Wings, where you in fact your newly grown wings, as since about every video I make has a Dragon Ball reference in it, I guess that this is a variation of the 4 just technique. Light regeneration is a factor to the game being too easy, since you can regenerate life if you have enough light to eco at standby, and since you are given life extensions throughout the story. The shield is useless since you can't really do anything while having it activated, but light freeze and light wings are different since they are primarily made for platforming, but nothing really stops you from using elsewhere, like for example in time challenge or combat. 
And since you can use your weapons while in this form, it's just too OP, to be honest. Anyways, we proceed further with the arena matches, and by the end of the third one, we find out that Sink is in Spartacus. And when it seems like it's 1v1.5, and we don't get the third arena thing, and we continue to do stuff for Spartacus. However, a bit later, Ashlyn contacts Jack, wanting him to come back to the city. Jack says no, Ashlyn gives Jack the seal of Mar and the jackpot, which has an extra to it. When Ashlyn leaves, and Jack suddenly goes to the Precursor Mountain Temple, using the seal of Mar and jetport to use some Precursor subrails in order to enter the city. I don't get the reason either, but since the circuit segues, let's talk about one small thing before we leave the desert. The cars. The cars are different enough to talk about them separately. I'll only discuss the ones we get throughout the story. First off is this pathetic thing. Second is this one, which fires bullets. Third is this one, which jumps really high and fires grenade. Fourth is this heavy shit. And fifth is this other heavy shit. You get three extra ones if you buy them with precursor orbs. I personally prefer the third one, mostly due to jump boost and the fact that this weapon one shots the enemies. However, one thing is present with all of them the controls. If you swing, be prepared to spin all over the place because doing sharp turns results in just that. Everything else about the car works just fine, but this just aggravates me. Back on track with the store though, Jack, Daxter, and Pecker take the precursor subways over to the eco mine, which looks like it just right outside the city wall. When we get to the end of the mine, we encounter Vigor, who spots on some words which form a sentence about some plot twist. He's a bad guy. Oh shit! He attacked the palace so they could find some shit beneath it and now we face against the boss. It's some version of the precursor robot from Jack 1, which is a neat touch. We defeat the robot to go up, leading into Haven City. We get out of the mine from the same way we went up the palace support tower from Jack 2. So that's the thing. Before continuing any further, let's talk about Haven City. Because the palace was destroyed, many areas in Haven City, such as the stadium and the bazaar, went away with it. And sometime in between Jack 2 and Jack 3, the war slums and a chunk of the slums have been renovated. However, quite a few areas, such as Dead Town and the public station, have been left out due to obvious reasons. Even layouts in returning areas have changed. I'm not just talking about the areas like Haven Forest, but also Haven City itself. Looking away from the fact that many areas have been destroyed, many areas like the entrance to the bazaar have been left out. Even though it's destroyed, there will just be a wall. We would have rubble. Not only that, but Haven City itself is smaller, not just due to wrecked places. Enough about that, let's return to the plot. Jack and Daxter head off to the place where the slums was before. There's a force field for reasons, which separate us from Sable Sakira which stand on the other side. We need to go through the sewers to get there. In one way, the sewers are a lot more interconnected than previously, but you can only go a certain ways at certain points in time. Anyways, we make it through the sewers, which takes us to the board. We are Torn, who has set up basic crew slash Daxter's old bar. From here, we just do stuff beneficial for Haven City. The port and freedom HQ, as they call it, is separated by several force fields, and we need to blow ourselves deeper in. We have a flyback to Spargus on occasion due to missions. Also, this is something we should probably discuss. The Crimson Guard bots. Get it? KGB is led by returning Errol, who survived the incident in Jack 2. A war factory spits him out, and that's no good. The Malheads have also set up shop within Haven City. I guess someone forgot to flip the shield switch. They reside in the farming areas from Jack 2. The KG are in most other areas of the city. This is war, and as we all know, war is hell. While we're doing all that, we're going to Heavy Forest and learn more about the menace. The Daystar, the thing that brings the end of the world, is a spaceship containing precursors mutated through Dark Eco. However, we need to first blow up the KG War Factory high up in the sky. So we blow ourselves into the new part of Heavy City, do some missions, which includes getting a key call with the help of a digitized pin who dumped this brain into the Haven City Eco Grid. And we take the thing that Ashley used to get to the KG War Factory. We confront Arrow up there and he has partnered up with the aliens. We take him out and teleport away from the crumbling thing. We do some more stuff, like saving Spargus from the aliens. After that, we basically get the third arena proof thing, which combined with the other two makes a beacon. Press it, and the cavalry gets sent in. The end is nigh now. We are now traversing through the ruins of the destroyed parts of Haven City, except that town because that would just be unrealistic. We are going towards the palace in order to go beneath it through the catacombs, which are one floor beneath the tomb of Mar. Like, I guess. Yeah, in there lies an even bigger gun than the one in Jack 2, and that is gonna be used on the ship. We get there from the stadium, and Jack uses the beacon and heads into the place. When we go deeper in, we get surrounded, and Demos wrecks the place with his car. The beacon was useful for something, and we head further in. But when we arrive at the palace ruins, Asha flips the car and puts Demos on the deathbed. 
Before he dies, he gives Jack the seal to the House of Mark, telling him that his son, who was separated from him when Deimos was exiled, wears the thing. Then, Jack realizes that Deimos is Jack's father and doesn't get the chance to tell him. That's when Vigor steps in, telling him that he was irresponsible for Deimos being exiled. Oh, and why is he here? He wants to go into the catacombs without the interference of those filthy dark egos. What a nice guy. We take the yellow thing down there and the precursor talks to us, charging up the weapon. We get to be a precursor. How oh, nice. And that's when Vigo steps in, wanting to become a precursor. He gets the power, but Daxter complains, and the door opens, within it containing Otzels, or as they like to be called, precursors. Hmm, fine twist. And now this prick becomes a precursor, but since the weapon is charging, we need to use a teleporter to stop Errol ourselves and teleport away. However, this results in Errol escaping in some big spider tank, and we engage in the Sand Shark. If we need to fight while in the car, why could you just give us the option to use our vehicles? Anyways, we shoot the feet then climb up on the back where we kill Errol for the first time for the last time. We celebrate his bargains, the precursor sleeve, not the long with Jack, Daxter gets passed, Tess becomes a precursor, and the game ends. So, that's Jack 3. It's a fun game, and the story is more easily enjoyable, but one thing which both elevates it and lowers it is the gameplay. You have more to work with, but it results in the game being too easy. Don't get me wrong, if you haven't played it, go right ahead, because it's still a fun time. However, if you want to, play the PS2 version, where lower resolution hides a lot of details. This goes to our other Jack and Daxter games too. I haven't really played the PS3 version, so I don't know if the unloaded details thing is a problem there. Anyways, we'll now move on to a new game. Probably as of now, I figured out which game to play, but I'm just too lazy to end the script. So next time, I'll review The Emperor's New Groove for PS1. I'll see you then! Oh, by the way, the music was better than Jack 2, but where's the Jack 1?